started. Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's really good to be uh, with you guys. My name is uh, Sharyar Barati, uh, running uh, Project Ventures. And today I'll be sharing some hints and tips about how investors actually look at your investor proposition, at your startup, how they evaluate an investment opportunity. So hopefully it can complement what you were just uh, hearing uh, uh, from Perdi and I'll add a bit of context from an investor perspective. Just a few words about myself. I have uh, hands-on experience working in startups, uh, leading commercial and operational activities at a company called Capital Pilot previously. Uh, also launched a fund which was named a UK's first automated VC fund that was Boost Fund 1. Some of you might have heard the name. That was a couple of years ago through which we led investments into 50 um, startups across different sectors in the UK, primarily at early stage pre -seed and seed. So that's kind of where my expertise and sweet spot is. I personally assessed or oversaw assessments of more than 2,000 startups and also contributed to the development of a systematic rating system startup evaluation tool at the previous company. So I've seen a lot of decks. I've looked at a lot of startups. We've I've worn both the startup operator hat and an investor hat. So hopefully I can add uh, provide some uh, helpful uh, hints and tips when it comes to preparing for investments. Now, uh, before uh, we go into the main contents of the presentation, let's just spend a, a couple of minutes on the topic of the right investor. As I'm sure a lot of you might have just started this journey, some of you might have more experience, you've already dealt with different types of investors, etc. But surely for any founder, that question pops at some stage earlier uh, in their journey. Uh, should I approach angel investors? Should I approach VCs? Sometimes VC, the name, when it the, you hear, hear the name VC, it scares you off. Oh, these are the sharks want to take away my equity, etc. So should I go with angels? Who are they? How do I find them, etc.? So this is a very common question. And it's absolutely a crucial one for every founder to understand who their right investor at that stage of development they're uh, at is. Um, so it's important to do a bit of research, a bit of reading about the differences. Angels obviously are individuals who are investing their own capital, whereas VCs are more of an institutional investor. They're organizations who've pooled investment or money or capital from different institutions or individuals, and they have a mandate to deploy that into a specific types or categories of startups. So first of all, it's important to do the research to understand what sort of uh, companies each of these investors invest. With VCs, it's easy because you can just go onto their website, look at their investment thesis, understand what areas they invest in at what stage. And that should be your guideline. I mean, I've seen a lot of startups applying cold calling, cold messaging VCs, asking for investments. Whereas uh, if you've if the founder had spent a few seconds on the website, they would have realized that actually that VC is probably investing in a completely different stage and different side, sorts of businesses. It's a good um, kind of exercise to go through that. Also, it's important to know that when it comes to VCs, VCs, because they have a mandate on behalf of their own investors to deploy investments, they also have a very particular risk and uh, return appetite. They want, as we've heard uh, over and over, they want to make returns. So they look at, I mean, I don't like the notion of calling every startup a deal, because for me, it's way more. This is actually, those startups are actually doing something fundamental, transformational. So I don't want to call them deal. But unfortunately, that's kind of the sort of mindset primarily uh, in the VC world. So they want to make returns. They have a timeline for that. So they will at some point push you to make those returns. So if you are prepared, if you are a founder uh, who are prepared to do that, then great, VCs are for you. But if you're looking for a lifestyle business, who want to have a steady, uh, generate steady uh, revenues and income and make it your own lifestyle, then maybe think tw twice before approaching VCs. In which case there are angel investors or angel networks or other form or family offices or different sorts of investors who might be more aligned with your um, 
kind of long-term view. So that's also another consideration. Um, again, just provided some bullet points. Don't want to spend too much time because there's a lot of content uh, that I want to cover later on. Uh, angels and VCs, they have different investment size stages. Angels typically come in earlier, whereas VCs, although there are a growing number of very early stage pre-seed investors, they're mostly coming up, coming in with a larger ticket size or investment sizes. Uh, in terms of involvement and expertise, a lot of VCs tend to get actively involved with the portfolio companies. Same with angels, not necessarily, but angels who have a passion for the particular startup that you're working on might add a lot of value because they invest out of, might invest emotionally, whereas VCs, as I said, look at it as a deal. So again, that's also another consideration. As I mentioned, return expectations, risk tolerance is different. And it's very important to have an alignment of vision and values. When, you, when it comes to choosing the right investor. So uh, with that in mind, how can you improve your investability? And in other words, what are some of the things and, uh, that investors look at and how do they evaluate investment uh, propositions? Uh, some of this might have already been covered in the previous presentation as I come, came in later. So, I mean, I'll try to um, add a bit of context and hopefully uh, uh, if you have any questions at the end, I'm more than happy to answer. So we all know investors are, are time poor. I mean, some call it a 90 second rule, some call it a 30 second, three minute rule. But the uh, uh, kind of the point is that they don't spend a lot of time, a huge amount of time on your pitch deck. So it's absolutely important to convey the message you want to provide them as concisely and as clearly as possible in those 90 seconds. And that requires you to have a very crisp presentation and complement that as well as a messaging and complement that with a strong proposition. It's not just about having a very nicely done pretty presentation if it's not complemented with a strong proposition. Uh, and vice versa, I've seen many strong startups who have a very strong proposition, but because they're not able to convey the messages clearly and concisely, and I'm not necessarily only talking about the design, it's just the format, the, the order, kind of the contents, et cetera. If you're not able to articulate that investor proposition as clearly as possible, you might have lost your chance because in those 90 second rules, if the investor does not see all the key information that they're looking for, and uh, in the most clear way to make it easy for them to digest and understand the key points, you probably uh, have lost your chance. So that's also uh, quite an important consideration when it comes to preparing uh, for um, your pitches. So uh, the importance of storytelling. I mean, every startup has their own story. You have their own, your own DNA. And it's very important to kind of uh, steer, steering away from being a generic startup. Just make sure that you're conveying that DNA, that story. Make sure what you're providing in your pitch deck follows a storyline. And also when, it, you, when you meet uh, investors, that's also important to come through. You need to be able to convey or tell your story and make it relatable and exciting, exciting for uh, those investors. Uh, you need to grab investors' attention. So I'm not uh, saying that you should fabricate stuff or pretend something you're not. Absolutely not. But think very thoroughly about your own story, your own journey, what the problem you're solving, etc. And make sure you have a very coherent and uh, story and make sure that comes across and comes through in your presentation as well, because that could uh, significantly improve the chances of, a, of an investor taking an interest and wanting to meet with you and take it from there. Um, obviously, you've uh, uh, already, uh, you're probably all familiar with this list of things that uh, investors expect to see in your pitch deck in no particular order. Every, again, that goes back to the same story. Make sure you have your own story. Make sure the slides you put together follows that story in a logical way. But in any case, every investor wants to see the problem and the opportunity you're um, addressing, your, what your solution is, what your value proposition is. How big is the market? Market sizing, we'll come to that later. Uh, what your business model is. In other words, how are you generating revenue? What's your underlying magic? What's the thing that sets you apart from your comp competitors? What's your go-to-market strategy? How are you planning to attract or acquire customers? Traction, which is quite a significant topic, which we'll cover in a bit as well. Competition, competition or the competitor landscape, your team, financial projections, milestones, the ask, etc. So you're all familiar with that. Now let's dive into 
uh, some of those. Now, for me, and I'm saying this from experience, having looked at hundreds, probably thousands of pitch decks, the first step, in my view, uh, and it, it may not be a one-fits-all formula, but uh, it's very important for every founder to identify precisely who your target audience is. At the end of the day, you are working to solve a problem and that problem needs to be real. And that problem, I mean, someone somewhere is owning that problem. So you need to identify who is it? Who's your target audience? Who's the exact precise target audience that uh, you're um, kind of targeting? So, and it's perfectly possible that at early days where you're figuring out your product market fit, that target audience is not very specific. You're testing out the pro your proposition on different target audiences. So it's, it's absolutely fine. It's understandable. But once you build your MVP out and you prepare for fundraising, it's very important to finally crack that and identify. And even if you know, there are many different de demographics, there's probably that one demo demographic uh, or target audience that's the most prominent one. So maybe that could be a good starting point. That is where the problem is more prominent and your solution might be most needed. So make sure you've identified the target audience precisely. And I'll tell you what, why? Because that will have a direct impact on how you do your market sizing. And I've heard, believe me, I've heard so many founders who've struggled with market sizing to quantify uh, the market opportunity and, uh, to guess what? You're not alone. I mean, there are many founders in that category and that's absolutely fine. Again, uh, as long as you are able to identify the target audience, this will become very easy. There are different ways to look at market sizing. Some look at it in a, a bottom up, uh, as a bottom up approach. Some do it top down, uh, for example, coming up and defining the, the big opportunity, the overall side of the market, and then applying a series of assumptions and going a layer down until you come up with your uh, immediate target audience. So Tam, Sam, Sam, you're probably familiar with those terms. Uh, please have a, a redo uh, about these. These are standard terms that every investor probably expect to see in every pitch deck. Um, so um, going back to my point, how defining uh, or identifying the target audience could help you specifically in, the, in a bottom-up approach. If you know who your customer is, then you can quantify that. If you know what market you're attract, approaching, you can quantify the number of potential customers, whether they're individuals, let's say women between age X and Y or SMEs in this particular sector, et cetera. As long as you know that's uh, clearly, you can quantify that. You can uh, say how many of those exist. You can define what your first go-to market is, what the immediate market you're at, uh, approaching is, and then you can build it up upon that, how many of those exist, and then you can calculate uh, the overall market size by simply multiplying the number of customers by your unit price, the average unit price. And then, for example, you're starting in the UK or in, a, in London or whatever, then you can define that as your sum, and then the Europe might be your uh, SAM, and then globally, or depending, I mean, this is just an example, then you can build up on that as long as you know who you're attracting. Um, another benefit of knowing who your audience is, is that you can define a very clear go-to-market strategy. At the end of the day, your go-to-market strategy is about how you're acquiring uh, new customers, uh, your target customer. So if you know who they are, you can probably come up with different ways or to attract them, to approach them, to reach out to them, whether it's uh, through different kind of online, offline mechanisms, whether it's uh, digital marketing, whether it's through partnerships, doing roadshows, through intermediaries, direct, indirect, using influencers, conferences, roadshows, et cetera, et cetera. That would be specific to each business. But again, the key is to know who you're attracting and then finding the best route to access them, to acquire them. And that's also another important factor that a lot of investors look at. They want to know how you're planning, because that will tell them something about your scalability as well. Because if you have the, if you're adopting the right uh, method to attract customers and it's replicable and scalable, then you can potentially increase your revenue, build more 
traction, which brings me to the next slide. And that's something a lot of the most investors want to see. Now, traction is another very, very important uh, aspect that investors attach a lot of value. Um, and it causes a lot of confusion as well. So what is traction? When, you, when we talk about traction, immediately people think about revenue. And that's right. I mean, revenue, recurring revenue is the ultimate form of traction. That's the thing that every startup is uh, aiming to get to. And that's what investors want to see. But traction can mean different things at different stages in your development. And let's uh, kind of clarify that a little bit. At early stage, there are not that many founders or startups who are able to generate revenue. Perfectly fine. That's perfectly acceptable. Uh, but there are other means other than attraction, other uh, metrics that you can show to your investors to show to suggest that there are um there is evidence of potential customer. So when we come when it comes to traction, that's the key important key thing to consider. The evidence for real or potential demand for your product. That could be signups, that could be registrations, that could be number of app downloads, that could be letters of intent, expressions of interest, depending on what area, what industry sector you're operating in, uh, or what kind of business model you're pursuing. So th these could become uh, forms of traction that you can show. These are signs, these are evidences that someone out there has expressed interest in your offering. And there is a likelihood that they will convert into paying customers when you advance uh, or develop your product further. But ultimately it's about sales and getting to uh, revenue. Now, how about these awards, mentions in magazines, at, uh, attending pitching competitions, winning pitching competitions, having well-known advisors on board. Now, um, I've seen a lot of founders who confuse this as, uh, as traction and they showcase them as forms of traction. Well, these are not really uh, um, show, showing, these are not necessarily showing traction. These are great validations of credibility of your business but don't necessarily translate into demand for your product or service. So by all means, show them, moan about them. Uh, this is uh, something that you should be proud of and talk about it in your pitch deck, but don't confuse it with the actual traction because none of these will translate into traction. They can help you attract more customers, hopefully, but not necessarily, these are not necessarily considered forms of traction. Um, just the following bullet point might provide you with some guidelines about how investors look at uh, traction consistent with your stage of development. For example, if you're a B2C early stage business with no product or prototype, signups or having a waiting list or pre-orders could be considered as uh, forms of ideal for them, forms of traction. As a B2B early stage business, maybe letters of intent or again, pre-orders could be considered traction. Uh, if you're an app platform or a SaaS business, number of users, number of signups, et cetera, those could be considered as form of traction. And for later stage businesses, uh, revenue, and even better if you have profit, those are the ideal uh, forms of traction that you need to show. Um, the following uh, matrix uh, somewhat kind of summarizes some of the topics I've covered so far. It puts everything into perspective, come, starting with who your customer is, then defining how this, uh, calculating how many customers exist and where are those customers based. So that will help you with your market sizing, going into the, your go-to-market strategy. How can you reach your customer? What channels or routes do you need to use to access those customers? At the same time, you're kind of validating the demand. Is there enough customers within that tar target audience, the market that you're trying to penetrate? Are they interested in your products? You can validate that as you build uh, your audience. Are they willing to pay? Is anyone using your product? So now we're getting into traction. So again, as you can see, it may not be the uh, prettiest uh, kind of matrix, but I'm just trying to... Uh, kind of uh, put all these key questions which are very much interlinked and you should think about all of them uh, together as you build out your proposition because they're effectively, uh, it will help you position yourself in the best possible way. Now, uh, the team, um, we all know as uh, at early stage, a lot of importance uh, is attached to the team. 
simply because one of the reasons could be the fact that early stage companies can pivot uh, with whatever internal or external circumstances you might need to change your focus and pivot into, into a different field. So at the end of the day, it's the team in power who's executing on the business. And so those are the, the key drivers of this uh, business. So it's very important to have the right elements in your team. The way investors look at the team uh, is there are a number of ways that the investors look at it. The first and foremost, it's about completeness of team expertise. Now you've set yourself out to build a product in X market, for example. Do you have the right domain expertise in your core team of that market? Do you have technical, I mean, if you're a tech business, technical expertise probably means tech resource, in-house tech or uh, other kind of aspects of the business. Do you have technical expertise? Do you have any experience growing a business or do you have any sales experience? At the end of the day, it's this is all about sales. Fundraising is a sales activity to begin with. But also uh, when you're rolling out your product or service to the market, that's the same. So in order to build a successful business, you need to say, to sell. So all of those are uh, different sorts of expertise that uh, investors want to see in your core team. A bonus would be prior startup experience. Uh, serial entrepreneurs or whether if, whether successful or unsuccessful, if you have been a part of a startup before, especially as a, at, the, at the leadership level, you've probably come across and you've experienced firsthand certain challenges that startups uh, face. And if you haven't had that experience, it might might take a little while before you get familiarized with those and you might uh, kind of uh, get some, see some failures before you pull yourself back up and do it. Whereas if you have prior experience, prior startup experience or someone, whether as an advisor or a core member of the team who have prior, ex prior startup experience, they can share those experiences with you and they can help you navigate through those challenges. Um, at the end of the day, it's about showing a competitive edge from the team. What is so unique about this team at the helm that makes you the best possible team, given the circumstances, to build that product or roll out that service that you're working on? It's really important to convey that uh, in, uh, initially in your pitch deck, but also when it comes to face-to-face -face meetings with investors, they want to kind of see that. Uh, as well. So uh, looking again, holistically, I mean, it's all about having collective experience. And of course, the question might be that as a, if you're a solo founder, or don't have a team around you, how do investors look at it? Well, you're not alone. Again, there are many startups who start uh, as solo founders, and then they build a team. At the end of the day, there are ways around it. I mean, if you're not in a position to hire anyone in your team yet, or you don't have any other business partners or co-founders, you can work with advisors to begin with. You can fill in some of those gaps by onboarding some trusted advisors in your network who have that expertise and advisors may ne not necessarily require any monetary compensation at that stage. Maybe it's about something they want to um, add value to, et cetera. I mean, you can, you can kind of uh, decide that for yourself, how you want to engage with them. But it's important to show, I mean, if you're not having uh, all or some of those key expertise in your team, you'll get questioned. You'll get questioned. And I'm not saying that you may not be able to succeed because I've seen solo founders who've succeeded and managed to raise uh, investments and build very successful business and grow the team. So that's absolutely not the point, but be prepared to be questioned, be asked this question and you need to have uh, answers. And sometimes it's about, the answer is about the credibility of your planned uh, team build strategy. As long as you're aware of what gaps in skill sets or expertise you have in the core team and you have concrete plans, to get those expertise or those people on board, that might be it. Again, depending on what stage you're at. Um, just a few uh, tips about the way you present team. Again, going back to the 90 second rule, it's important that every team member, you have it obviously a team slide and uh, you clearly uh, mention your job description. Any relevant experience is mentioned very clearly uh, and include all the core team members and advisors. Consistency is also key. 
the first thing that investors look at they uh, is probably your LinkedIn. When they look at a pitch deck, they might go straight to LinkedIn to look you up, look the core team up and the website as well, the team page on the website. If there are inconsistencies, that might raise the red flag. We've seen so many pitch decks where, where they feature certain individuals. When you go to their LinkedIn profile, there's no mention whatsoever of that. So, and there might be a good reason for it, but make sure that the consist you have the answers to those questions and the consistency is there between different channels, which are primarily the website, the LinkedIn, and your pitch deck. And everything is up to date, of course. Um, another big challenge for many of the founders that uh, we have worked with previously is about financial modeling. So uh, not all of us are experts in financial modeling, but uh, this nevertheless is one of the key uh, aspects of your investor proposition. may not be the first thing that investors look for. Your pitch deck is the, your gateway into uh, uh, the investment world, but once you engage with the investor and they want to do further due diligence or they want to have further chat, in most cases, they want to see your financial projections simply because they want to know how you're generating revenue, what, how, uh, what the kind of, how you're growing the business, what's the, the end value, uh, the value that you're bringing to the table, et cetera. Considering that these are all assumptions, by the way, I mean, I'm not, this is, there is no guarantee whatsoever that any of these projections and expectations can take place. So therefore, the key thing here is the credibility and sensibility of your assumptions. So that's the key thing you need to take away from this. Uh, you need to have very clear assumptions, sensible assumptions, and have a very logical revenue buildup. Obviously, we most investors want to see minimum three-year uh, worth of projections, ideally five. But please, you need to show that those revenue builds up, build up clearly. You need to have your costs and expenses build up again in the same time horizon, using uh, building upon the credible assumptions, uh, your cash flow projections, and also include uh, unit economics. What's the cost of acquiring customers? What's the long term value, uh, lifetime value of each customer, et cetera? These are some of the things that investors want to see because it says something about your scalability. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's a very, very useful exercise for every founder to do. I mean, I know a lot of founders, some founders want to outsource this to accountants, et cetera. But I would encourage everyone to have a stab at it yourself. Build your own financial uh, uh, model, even if it's a very simple um, kind of high level one, because it forces you to think about how you're planning to grow your business. It forces you to think about different revenue streams and how they expect to grow. It forces you to think uh, about your cost uh, and expenses and how to optimize it, how to minimize that so it can kind of increase your profits, et cetera, um, and how uh, how you're planning to use cash. At which point do you actually expect, do you need to have cash injection in form of investments and how you're planning to burn that cash for how long? And that, that therefore that gives you a sense about which direction you're heading to and might send, say something about your business model, some flaws you might identify in the business model that you need to address, et cetera. So that's uh, kind of the basis. And as I said, this is all about assumptions, assumptions, assumptions. So make sure you spend enough time doing those assumptions. Um, final uh, slide that I want to cover before opening up to questions is that do not forget investors in your presentation. It's very easy to uh, come up or create a pitch deck which talks extensively about your product. It looks like a product catalog, if you like, or goes into too much details about your offering, et cetera, but forgets the key audience here. This is about attracting investors and investors are looking for a business, um, a, an a scalable business that can hopefully make some returns over time uh, on their investment, not necessarily an idea solution or product catalog. So to put things into perspective and to context, make sure that you remember that this is something you're building for investors. Try to think from an investor perspective, what are the things that they want to see? What are the key points that can de-risk this uh, proposition in the eye of in investors and make sure those key informations are there. 
And that brings me to the end of the presentation. Uh, it, I just tried to go through the content as quickly as possible so we can uh, have some time to answer some detailed uh, questions if there is. Uh, if you have any, obviously, uh, if you want to reach out to me, this is my email. You can, you're welcome to follow Project Ventures page on LinkedIn. I sometimes post uh, helpful tips and hints for founders and feel free to follow uh, me on LinkedIn as well. Again, I because I simply share a lot of uh, content which might be useful. So that's, there you go. With that said, um, I'm open to answer any questions you guys have. Thank you. If you want to ask a question directly, just raise your hand. Um, and if you want to ask a question in the chat, then one of us can read it out for you, Sharia, to make it a bit easier. Um, yeah. So do you want to take your presentation up as well so we can see everybody? Um, Samaya, do you want to go first? Um, my question um, is in relation to Tam, Sam and Som. So, um, I'm, I'm building a carbon credit marketplace for voluntary carbon market. Um, market currently is worth two billion. Um, and the revenue that we can, like my company can potentially get is 30% of the market size. So is my TAM going to be two billion or is it just, you know, the service fee that we could, we could um, access? It's so typically the way I look at it, TAM is the biggest possible market that you can uh, capture in an ideal world. Okay. And okay. then uh, that portion of the market that you're realistic going, realistically going to capture uh, will be uh, the next level down. And obviously from that 30% third, that, 30 that might be again a, a stretch goal. So there might be a sub segment of that 30% hmm going to directly as your first or initial target audience maybe there's a sub -se um, sector segment of that market that could be uh, your uh, sum your serviceable obtainable market your immediate market if you like and then building up on that so again at the end of the day uh, you can kind of in an ideal world think about what is the biggest possible market that you can think of and work down applying these assumptions what are the realistic uh, sub segments of that market that you can acquire and then you can build your SAM and SOM accordingly. So you would say 2 billion is the TAM? Or... Um, it could be, again, I mean, that's very specific and I'm not too familiar, but that could be considered as the TAM if that's the ultimate size of the yeah. market. I mean, but, if I change the question a little bit, suppose um, you're in fund management, um, in impact investing, the market is worth um, approximately 1 trillion but um, your service is the fund management. So the fees that you would take from the 1 trillion, which is 1% or say 2% of it. So would the TAM be the actual assets under management, which is 1 trillion? Or is it is it that service fee that you would take or that you could tap into? So then, so um, are you talking about how fund management works uh, or because that's because I mean, market sizing, I mean, what I was alluding to was about market size for your startup. It doesn't necessarily uh, mean that fund managers take any fees off of that uh, overall market size. So I didn't, I may not have uh, got your question clearly. Um, so my question is, again, in relation to um, total um, addressable market, um, one part of my business is um, fund management, so impact investing. Right. So okay. I'm looking at I'm, I'm, I'm looking at impact investments. Um, market is worth one trillion. Um, and but the only um, fees that I'll take, you know, from my um, investors is going to be about one to two percent. So what's my total market size? Is it one trillion or is it one? to two percent of that one trillion so again uh, as far as the fund management business con is considered that's the fees are typically charged of the total assets that you manage it's not necessarily mm -hmm. the market size it's about how much investments you're raising and deploying and that's uh, the percentage one or two percentage of uh the the assets that you're managing that is your so that's for me that's different uh, to the market size. So again, might be a very specific, I mean, happy to take this offline because that might uh, okay, uh, sure. understand better what your business yeah. model for this fund management business is okay. differently to a startup. So there might be some uh, kind of uh, details that I'm missing, but uh, okay, sure. take that offline if you want to chat that. 
that would be great. Thank you. Okay. Um, one other question I have. Sorry, am I? Can no, I no. carry on? Go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, so I've got I've built a network of advisors who are you know um, readily available if I have any questions, um, which is fantastic. But obviously, I've not given them any equity as you know it's not really any sort of tangible or financial benefit to me. Would I um, put list them out because um, they're quite happy to be listed out on my deck as advisors or would that look bad on my part to list those advisors out because I'm not giving them any remuneration? As no, it's, I mean, it's uh, perfectly possible at early stages that you bring on board advisors who have different incentives other than being compensated with equity. Okay. So if they are happy and if you trust them and if you think they add value, by all means, I think it's there's no harm putting them, but make sure that they are uh, okay with it. That's the key thing. And make sure that you know them, you trust them, and you know it's uh, they're bringing some value even if they're not compensated at this stage. Um, yeah, there's no harm. I mean, obviously, it's as I said, it's it will be helpful to, ha to list or showcase individuals uh, as advisors if you don't have any co-founders or other me core members of the team who bring in certain uh, expertise so if those advisors can fill in those gaps by all means okay brilliant thank you anastasia yeah thank you um so my question is about storytelling uh so my product is a marketplace so i have two audiences uh e-commerce shoppers and e-commerce brands and both audiences have their reasons to be on the platform uh and the paying customer is going to be the brands but still uh what should be the center of my storytelling what should be what should i uh which uh problem uh should i build my story about users problem or uh, brands are going to be the paying customer so again uh when it comes to storytelling what i was uh talking about was the overall story that you're telling in this case i was kind of talking about the story to investors so how how what is the unique story of your business but when it comes to your audiences at the end of the day at again uh, uh with limited information i know about your business the part the portion of th that target audience who's paying your services for your services or uh the product those should be that should be the focus because ultimately you're selling to them obviously when it comes to platforms double-sided platforms it's important to build uh, interest and volume on both sides so of course that, that don't mean to ignore the other part but at the end of the day the part that's bringing you generating your revenue should probably be um the focal point here because you're really that's the the audience you want to attract to uh make your business sustainable and grow and then hopefully obviously the other side will come through. so that's kind of uh with limited information that i have that's probably the uh my my suggestion about it c thank you so much um i'm wondering about competition and birdie also talked about this um, the axis, the chart in which you sort of put ticks and crosses. I heard a lot of feedback on this, um, you know, frame the, from investors that it just doesn't make sense at all. And when I also look at the landscape, it is confusing and it doesn't quite, you know, illustrate the unique value proposition and competitive advantage that I have because I don't know exactly how they made those decisions. So my question is that if I'm operating in a um, crowded market, and if there are startups that are pre-IPO, but I still know my unique value proposition and it's different than what they're offering, how would I, um, or how would you advise me to build a solid go-to-market strategy so that I can show that it is tangible, that I can gain these market shares in a crowded market where I am niching instead of going broad? Um, so again, um, at, at the initial stage, you need to, uh, if you have built something unique that sets you apart, first of all, I mean, it's still, I mean, whatever format you decide to do your competitive analysis or landscape in your pitch deck, I mean, you said it uh, right. I mean, the key thing is to show that uniqueness, whether it's a matrix or a table of features, et cetera. And then obviously that requires you to do as much research as possible. Obviously, uh, acknowledge that there not every piece of information information might be available about competitors, but also there are key features that you can try nevertheless identify. So if you are able to 
uh, list those and then find your own niche uniqueness. Then it's about validating that. Go to your uh, target audience, try to offer it, sell it and see and kind of get live feedback from the market. And if that's validated, then you effectively, you found yourself your niche and you validated the demand. And then th at that point, it's about how you convey that to investors. Um, it's again, perfectly uh, possible that the, in a crowded market, there are many other players who are doing something similar, but again, that they may not have a, uh, that access to that particular niche or that niche know-how that you have. And that might be the thing you sets you apart. So again, uh, it's an iterative process. You need to do your research, test it, validate it until you come up with, it, with your product market fit. You find your niche, you see evidence of demand. You're starting to build traction, as I mentioned. And then just it's about talking very clearly about that thing that sets you apart. No, and but it's exactly what investors want to see because, I mean, there we can always argue, yes, there are Googles or Amazons of the world who can do everything. But guess what? No, they, they have a very particular business model. They, they can if they want to build certain businesses, but that's not what they do. So there are still uh, spaces and opportunities for other smaller players to find their own niche and build their businesses upon that. I absolutely agree, um, but I mean illustrating that point in the pitch deck because when you do the charts, um, as uh, Engin said, for example, a few days ago, like they never wanted to go to that direction. So if I say that they don't have that feature, it, it sort of you know creates that subjective bias as if they tried and they couldn't, but that that's not the case and that not might not be the case. So how would you you show that competitive landscape in a more unbiased um illustration so to say again there is um no right way to go about it all i can say is you need to do your best to understand what is it that the others are doing and um, don't make things up because um obviously if there is no information available make you don't need to make things up because if someone who understands the market might pick it up and, and question you about it um, make it simple. I would say don't overcomplicate it. First of all, identify a handful of companies that are very closely linked to what you're doing. At high level, first of all, identify what is the key thing that you are doing um, and make it simple. Make a simple graph or matrix, but put your emphasis on your uniqueness. Describe it. Don't assume that by simply looking at a matrix or a table, even if there are ticks and crosses, etc., uh, it may not necessarily jump out what your uniqueness is. That's a good visual way of showing who else is out there, what are some of the key features to the best of your knowledge. But in a text format, just make sure that you talk about, you mention that uniqueness, what sets you apart. Clearly, and that might be the thing that will, investors will want to see because we all know that there are other, and it's always possible that you are uh, you miss some key, some other players. I mean, there are always startups being formed every day, and we cannot possibly be on top of everything. What we can do is, to the best of our knowledge, come up with the list of most prominent companies that everyone knows about, most people know about, and find your own position vis-a-vis -vis those companies again that's um again there's no as i said there's no easy way to do it. there's no easy answer it's very case specific but you it's about making sure you're clearly conveying that uniqueness and you can back it up you're not making things up you can back it up i'm just going to quickly um go to a question in the chat and then we've got four more questions um with people with the hand raised and um, 10 minutes. So we'll try and get through everyone. Um, finding the right data is crucial for calculating CAM, SAM and SOM. If founders are struggling to get that data, and there's a lot of founders that have spoken to us about this as well, what do you recommend that they do to get the most accurate numbers for that? So um, first of all, it may not be possible to find the most accurate number anyways. There are always different accounts. No matter how thorough your research is, you may not, you may never get to the most, the the, the, most, the, the truth. So it's at the end of the day, it's about estimates. Having very, again, same way that I mentioned about financial projections, you need to have sensible, credible assumptions. This is the same. 
do the best, do your research to the best of your ability. And it's perfectly uh, okay to come up with some sensible assumptions um, as long as you can reference it. Again, these days, I'm, it's, I mean, I find it hard to believe that there is no information. You cannot find any information online. I mean, there are so many different resources that can provide you with a sense of how large the market is. And then it's about you applying those assumptions. The other, on a, again, I mean, depending on a business model or what business you're working on, you might want to do some surveys if you have access to um, kind of uh, organizations who might have statistics which are not uh, shared online, which is not very likely. But again, you might just go directly to them, um, ask them. But again, that might may not be the the best way to back up your numbers. Make sure to you to do your research, some apply sensible assumptions, and work backwards. I would say. Thank you. Sarkhan. Uh, thank you so much, Perry. Um, th this is going to be a completely different uh, question. Um, uh, but what if you're trying to, uh, so your product has, you know, essentially um, aspects of different markets. What if you're trying to combine different markets and essentially create a new marketplace? How would you go about doing that? Is it about the market sizing, the question? or? Yes, yes. So, um, you know, my current market size isn't massive. It's around 5 billion. Uh, it's, it's meant to grow to 25 billion. Uh, whereas uh, complementary markets, uh, that's also within my scope is around 1 trillion. So how do I combine you know, multiple markets to create essentially a new market? So again, it goes back to the, if you're able to kind of define those separate individual markets, have the, your kind of be able to back it up using assumptions and then your overall size of market, you can simply, as long as you've shown the breakdown and you're able to back it up, you can then create your overall market size using as the, as the sum of those markets. But then again, probably with, with, without knowing too much uh, further information may not be able to give you the most accurate answer. But again, on in those markets, there is probably one market that is your go to market your first go to market so make sure i mean that's the, the biggest possible market size but in order for you to get from this stage from a to z to that stage you decide on what is that specific, specific market that you're targeting and then uh, do your sum or do your immediate target market with that do your go to market strategy uh, planning do your kind of customer acquisitions in that and then build up on that um, again, I've seen, um, again, we uh, have experienced it firsthand in my previous startup as well, that we were uh, targeting different markets. And in some ways, it was very uh, kind of we were shooting ourselves in the leg because we never really managed to figure out the identity of our business because we're trying to be too many things to too many people. So it's really important to simplify things, the journey. It's a long journey. And we all want to get to that end goal, but it's really important to break it down into different stages and phases. And what is the easiest way, simplest way for me to get myself into the market? What is the simplest market to penetrate? Knowing that obviously we're creating a new market, do take steps and maybe put your initial focus on that, everything uh, uh, around that, do your planning around that. And your longer with a longer term vision, next milestones being that you take steps towards achieving those. But as far as the market sizing is concerned, as long as you're able to show the breakdowns clearly and you can back it up, you can very well define your overall market opportunity as the aggregation or the sum of all those different markets that you're combining. Perfect. Thanks so much. Sahil. Hi, thank you. Uh, so you've already touched upon some of the answers uh, that I'm looking for in the now. Uh, but uh, just to drill down a little bit more on the dance Samsung side, so if you have multiple markets and multiple segments, uh, how, how do you effectively present that uh, overall TAM without diluting that message? And uh, I guess a follow-on question is that uh, if uh, 
if you have like let's say a really big segment versus a very niche segment that you go after, how do you make that choice in that very initial stage? So um, if I understood your question correctly, I mean, term, when it comes again, when it comes to TAM, I mean, there as I said, two ways, bottom up, top down. You might have access to certain research that talks about the overall size of the market, the volume of transactions in a certain market, et cetera, or the overall size of the market. So that might, uh, you might want to start from there as long as you're able to back it up, well-referenced, and then work your way backwards. Um, obviously, you have there's a niche uh, area, as I was answering to, uh, to your colleague earlier on, so work backward, what is the re realistic kind of sub segment of that overall market that you can acquire? And then what is the one that uh, kind of tiny part of the market that you're going to today, you're into acquire as the initial target. So that might, that's one way of going about it. Or the other way, obviously, as I said, bottom up, uh, you identify your immediate uh, market, you quantify the number of customers, whether individuals, or organizations, depending on your business model that exists in that particular niche. So starting with your niche. So for example, all um, SMEs in um, greater London, for example. Uh, so you can probably do a bit of research and identify roughly speaking, how many of those exist with say 10 to 25 employees that might be your immediate target audience or women between age this and that very specifically that's your niche how many of those exist and then be like what is then the next layer now i'm expanding into bigger market whether it's geographically or demographics etc and then work uh, upwards in order to come up with get to the, the biggest possible markets globally for example that you're approaching so again and just to follow up on that, uh, so would you advise that you show the disaggregation of these segments and markets on the pitch deck, or do you just bundle them together in the gamut? And then, yeah. Again, um, as long as you're not confusing your audience, in this case, the investors, you can show them. Sometimes I see it when you're uh, targeting different markets, et cetera, and you complicate the picture if you bring in too many kind of different numbers into the game, it just complicates uh, the picture. So then you create some questions, sometimes unnecessary questions for the investors to that might cast some doubts about whether or not you actually know your market. Um, again, make sure your pitch deck at early stage basically is very clearly done. So, uh, and it, in the simplest possible way. It's again, TAM, the overall size of the market is probably the best place to aggregate everything with kind of breakdown. But when it comes to defining your immediate market, make sure you're doing it very simply, in the most simple way. And you uh, show that in your picture. You don't want to create uh, or confuse people if you're bringing in too many numbers and markets into the equation, unless you have a very compelling reason to do so and you can back it up. Awesome. Thank you. Oops. Thanks. Got a, a couple of minutes, so we'll try and get through um, your questions, Noah Pratik. So, Noah, do you want to uh, ask us as clearly, as succinctly as possible, see if we can get through it in one minute? Yeah, my question is about traction. So as a pre-seed pre pitch, would you recommend including speculative partnerships? So, for example, I'm in talks with an institution at the moment, but that's going to take months to finalise. Do you just mention like confirmed deals, or can you talk about more speculative things. So ideally you mentioned confirmed deals that you can back it up. Uh, but depending on how well the, the conversation is going, you can uh, mention that you're in discussions with X, uh, Y, Z uh, organization in your pipeline. Again, there are ways that you can mention the names, bring them into the equation without necessarily uh, kind of making a thing a promise and a claim that you it's not he's not yet materialized so yes by all means feel free if you think it's going into the right direction make just mention that you're in discussion with that and that but obviously if there are any confirmed one that's the one that you can uh kind of talk about more openly uh in your pitch deck thanks and finally Pratik. um so 
if there is a company uh, doing kind of the same thing as I'm doing in a completely different market and they don't plan to enter uh, the UK and European market, is it? A, and they've been very successful. Is it a good idea to kind of highlight their success and say that we can kind of replicate that within the markets that we're focusing on, or is it just best to leave it out altogether? Um, again, if if you consider them as a direct competitor, then uh, it's worth mentioning them in your competitors. Uh, yeah. Hey, but if you're saying that they're operating in a completely different market, have no intention to enter, they may not be your direct competitor. But if they, there is a success story attached to them, maybe they've done really well, they've acquired, they're generating millions of revenue, or they've exited. I've I often see founders mentioning that as an as a successful example of their long term goal or the exit route. For example, this is the company in the, in another market who's done that. We plan to, of course, there is no harm. And again, make sure you're not, conf- I mean, uh, you mentioning it in the right place. If they are a competitor, you can put them in the, uh, as a competitor. If not, maybe find another way or place in your pitch deck to talk about it. And that's absolutely fine. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing all that wisdom. I'm just going to stop recording.